Well, hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Dwayne Butcher of Lean Frontiers and I have the pleasure of being your host for today. Just a few points of logistics uh, before we get started. If you have questions throughout the webinar today, you can submit those using the GoToWebinar toolbar that you'll find on the right side of your screen. It is best if you can submit those questions as they come uh, to mind. Uh, that will allow us to sift through the questions and feed them back to our presenter toward the end. So please keep up with questions as they come to mind. This session is being recorded. So if there's some important information you'd like to review, you certainly can do that. Uh, you're also welcome to share this with others in your organization. You can look for a link from me uh, within about 24 hours after this session ends with a link to that on-demand broadcast. Now, just a bit of context before I introduce our presenter. Uh, today's session is part of our summer-long webinar series that we've conducted, and it, it's all leading up to what we call Lean Leadership Week, which consists of the Lean Accounting Summit and the Lean HR Summit, which take place at the same time. Uh, if you are aligning or wanting to align accounting and the HR functions with lean thinking, then this certainly is an opportunity for you to do that by inviting your CFOs, your uh, HR uh, directors to an event like this. This is something I know that our presenter has actually keynoted at a few years ago. So this year we're going to be on beautiful Jekyll Island. You can actually see a shot of it here. This is the convention center. And just to the left of that, you see the ocean. So it is in a beautiful location. And that will take place September 20th and 21st. So. Mark, thank you for being here. Um, let me introduce our, our presenter, Mark Graven. Mark is a graduate of Northwestern University, who we were talking about this earlier, plays Purdue University on Thursday evening, right? Yep. So best of luck to a good season for Northwestern. Yeah. Uh, he also uh, studied at MIT, where he received a master's in mechanical engineering and an MBA. He's author of two Shingo Research Award-winning books. Uh, my guess is it soon will be three uh, before too awful long. Um, and he's also uh, a consultant in healthcare organizations throughout North America and Europe. Mark is a Lean, uh, Lean Enterprise Institute faculty member and founder of the popular leanblog.org and its podcast series. So Mark, really appreciate you being here. Really excited about this book and looking forward to uh, you unpacking some of this. So for now, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. All right. Well, thanks, Dwayne. Thanks for having me here. Thanks, everybody, for joining me. Um, yeah, nothing says summer like webinars, right, Dwayne? <laughs> That's summer. Thank you for including me in the summer webinar series. Um, so I'm going to talk today about some of the concepts from my book, Measures of Success. We've titled the webinar today, improve your lean management system with a simple chart, because I, I feel fortunate that um, the methodologies I'm gonna talk about today are something I was exposed to um, almost 25 years ago, kind of back to the context of, of Dr. Deming and my time at General Motors. And I think a lot of people in the lean community have just really never been exposed um, to a lot of Deming's work, which is in a lot of ways a foundation of the Toyota production system and some of these statistical methods that um, I, I think, and I've seen uh, them be really helpful. So to lay the, some of the, the, the foundation for this, you know, if we're talking about a lean management system, hopefully we would agree, it's not just a matter of methods, but there are important mindsets that um, should be involved for it to be a really effective lean management system. We, we hear this a lot, whether it's uh, a tool like 5S or management systems. It's not just the tool, as Toyota would say, it's the philosophy and the mindset. So on the left, we see it's not an all-inclusive list, but some of the tactics or methods you might see in the course of a lean management system, daily huddles, A3 problem solving, strategy deployment. And, and with that, you know, at the front line and the executive level and all points in between, we're, we're going to have performance measures. But I think a lot of these methods might not be effective without key mindsets. As we see on the right, again, not an all-encompassing list, but things like 
customer focus, respect for people, the idea from Toyota that it's the responsibility of leaders to create a system in which people can be successful, which is a very different mindset than just putting pressure on people, you know, do better, try harder, uh, make the numbers no matter what. You know, I think this lean approach really focuses on creating systems, but then engaging everybody in the process of improving that system in a scientific and systematic way. I think within a lean management system, uh, one goal is reducing waste. And I think this shouldn't be limited to waste in uh, the value adding work of frontline uh, employees. We can also look at reducing what you might call management waste. What are some of the things that leaders are doing, the questions they're asking that end up resulting in wasted motion or what you might call over-processing? I'll share some examples of this here today and some methods that I think provide uh, a better alternative. So as the subtitle of my book says, when we react less and we lead better, we can improve more. We can free up time that allows for uh, better prioritization and more improvement. So the, the phrase here, it's I wouldn't call this strictly a lean quote. This quote here, what gets measured gets managed often gets attributed to Peter Drucker and others. Uh, in fact, the, um, the Drucker Institute says Peter Drucker did not say this, but this phrase gets thrown around a lot. What gets measured gets managed. And I think a lot of the focus has always been on the what gets measured. And this is you know, part of the important strategy deployment, true north balanced scorecard discussion. What should we measure? There's often a lot of emphasis placed on setting targets or goals. And I think what gets shortchanged is the last part here. Well, what does it mean get managed? And this doesn't mean managing or manipulating the metric. I think it means managing the systems that lead to those results. So if we ask important questions about how do we manage? In my travels, I see a lot of different, you know, sort of common methods for tracking metrics. One is, I'll just call it the single data point on a whiteboard. It was an example from a healthcare clinic, the percentage of your analysis tests that are completed prior to a patient's appointment. We see here uh, the target is 75, the actual is 66. Um, there's some convenient color coding, it's red. We could tell you know, that the number is less than the target, but we tend to do this red-green color coding, which is perhaps helpful unless you're red-green colorblind. So I was at one organization and, and they have the single data point and they would do a, a magnet on the whiteboard, a, a smiley face, or in this case, it would be a frowny face. And it kind of got me thinking one day as I saw these throughout the organization. Well, if the frowny face inspires people to improve, maybe we need to ratchet up the emotion and that would help people improve more. You know, we could have a, a, a crying face. Um, we have somebody who's kind of snorting mad or, or even worse, we can have the, the big red angry face. Well, no, that's not really what I'm proposing as a solution there. But I think one of the key points here is that we need more than one data point. If two data points are not a trend, well, one data point is not a trend either. Because I think there's three key questions that we should ask about our metrics. And we can think about, does this whiteboard single data point help us? First question, are we achieving our target or goal? Well, the whiteboard shows us, no, we're not doing that this week. But I think a second question we should ask is, are we improving? Single data point doesn't tell us if that 66% is typical, if it's unusually good, if it's unusually bad compared to the norm. And that understanding of that variation and how a metric might be trending or fluctuating points us to the third question, how do we improve? Do we just react or should we step back and do something more systematic like an A3? So if you say, all right, well, one data point is not helpful. I've seen some organizations put up something they call a surgical dashboard. And I think, all right, whoa, we've got many, many months. We've got lots and lots of numbers. And I think it's really hard for people to detect trends in vast tables of numbers, like just to, to joke around a little bit more, it makes me wonder like, you know, whoever called this a dashboard, have they ever driven a car that has a dashboard? Because you know, a dashboard 
in your car has a limited number of metrics. They are very, very real time. I mean, you might see your average miles per gallon, but it tells you the speed right now. You know, data information that's required for real time decision making. That's different than looking back at historical trends. This might be called uh, a scorecard or, or something else, but it's not a dashboard. I mean, if we were to go and buy a, a new car, go buy a Tesla Model 3, how, you know, it wouldn't be very helpful to be driving down the road at 1.15 in the afternoon and to think, well, how fast am I driving? Well, my dashboard is showing me my hourly average speeds. And you know, the data is only as recent as 11 a.m. Well, this wouldn't be a very good dashboard. And I think it's not a good dashboard for an organization. Another thing I see a lot of is you know, the, the table of numbers combined with the red-green color coding. This is often called a bowling chart or a bowler. And again, you know, I, I think it's really hard to detect trends. I think it's really hard to answer these three key questions from a bowling chart with the red and green. Are we achieving our target or goal? Well, we see a lot of red. We're not achieving our goal all the time. Of course, that might mean we've set challenging goals. You know, I, there was one organization, I heard somebody comment, um, you know, oh, look, we've got a lot of green in our metrics. That's good. Well, it could be that they're setting the bar really low. Are we improving? I think it's hard to detect trends from numbers. You know, we look and say, well, huh, it looks like there's more red in the more recent months. So is, does that mean we're getting worse? And, and if so, are, is that significant? How do we improve? I think, you know, we have better methods that I'm going to show you next that help us understand if we have um, significant fluctuation or change in a metric or not, changes worth reacting to. So we could ask additional questions. Which of these numbers in the table, if any, suggest that the system has changed significantly? That's important to know as leaders. Which of these numbers here in September merit reaction, investigation, or explanation? And how do we prioritize which of these needs to be improved first or most urgently? So we, we might ask, what would Toyota do? In the Toyota Way Field Book, it's just one uh, book that talks about the management system and, and metrics, uh, Liker and Meyer, excellent book here. It says in the book that I talk about metrics, we should consistently measure and plot the measures on simple visual trend charts. So what do they mean by a visual trend chart? They don't illustrate this with a table of numbers. They use, basically, I would call this a run chart or an Excel we would call this a line chart. So we can see monthly average performance. We see a goal that's not being achieved. This is a pretty good starting point. I think this is more helpful in answering those questions. We're, we're, not, we're never hitting the goal. It seems like uh, we're just fluctuating. And so we need to improve that. Another point from the field book is about tendency or trends. We need to know, is the problem getting worse, improving, or staying the same? It looks like in this chart here, it's roughly staying the same. And it's necessary to consider whether every problem should be addressed. So where do we have gaps? Which gaps are most important? So I think it's important to understand that, as we saw in that last chart, there is always variation in our metrics. And a key question we should ask is, well, how much variation is normally there? How much routine variation do we have? So if you look at personal examples, things that you can measure in your daily life, your body weight might fluctuate within a range of a couple of pounds. And we shouldn't overreact to every half pound or pound increase or decrease. We need to look at trends over time. You can measure how long does it take you to drive to work every day. My Fitbit shows me my uh, resting heart rate and we can see that fluctuates across days. I don't know which of these, you know, we ask the same question, which of these should I be reacting to? Should I be concerned or not? So we need to identify and learn how to, to find signals in the noise of our data. If this routine variation is noise, we need to find meaningful signals. And a huge influence for me has been uh, Don Wheeler and his book, Understanding Variation, that I was first introduced to about 25 years ago. And uh, I was thrilled, I was honored when Dr. Wheeler agreed the right, uh, to write the foreword 
uh, for my book. And as Dr. Wheeler says, you know, every data set contains noise. Some data sets may contain signals. Therefore, before we can detect a signal, we must first filter out the noise. And the tool that we have for doing that is, as Wheeler calls it, process behavior charts. This is a form of statistical process control. You might call it a control chart. I think for a lot of reasons, process behavior chart is perhaps a better term. So in a book, in my book that talks about process behavior charts, um, I would sorely disappoint you, I'm sure, if I did not chart my daily book sales. And you know, I, I think this is kind of interesting, especially since the book was just released um, uh, as an ebook on August 4th. Now, here's what I would call a run chart from data that Amazon shows me uh, pretty much real time. We could see, all right, uh, the number of book sales fluctuates day to day. Now, we see here, you know, th this data point, that was the first day it officially launched. So is that data point uh, an outlier? If so, I think there's a good explanation for why that happened. It was launch day. So if we wanna take a run chart and turn it into a process behavior chart, we do a couple relatively simple things. We calculate an average and we draw that horizontal line on our chart. And sure enough, as we see in a lot of our metrics, uh, we have above average days and below average days. It goes up, it goes down. And then to see if we have signals or noise, the other thing that we can do is calculate from our baseline data, what we call upper and lower natural process limits. Now, normally these would be symmetrical. Uh, I probably can't really have negative book sales, so that lower limit is capped here at zero. But these limits tell me the expected range of variation. So we could say all of these data points, even that day that it launched, since that's just below the calculated upper limit, all of these data points are noise. We would call this a predictable metric. Now, whether I'm happy with the average number of sales or not, that's a different dimension. What this chart tells me is I can predict moving forward that I'm going to sell between about eight, uh, zero and 18 books a day unless something changes in the system. So we're looking for signals and learning to not overreact to the noise and not getting upset about a day that's a little bit low and not getting too excited about a day that's a little bit higher. So moving on from August 22nd, when I calculated these natural process limits, I actually had a day above the upper limit. And in fact, not one day, but two days in a row. This is a signal. And now it's an appropriate time to ask what changed, what happened, what can we learn from this? So we want to make sure we're not overreacting to the noise, but we are reacting to signal. And we have three rules for finding a signal. This is a different metric. So as we've seen already, a data point outside of those limits. Our second rule is looking for more of a shift in performance, eight or more consecutive data points above or below the average. And there's a third rule where we're looking for three out of four or three consecutive points that are closer to a limit than they are to the average. These are the times when we should ask what happened? Does it confirm a change that we made to the system or are we discovering um, some sort of apparent emergent change that we should understand? So if the bowling chart doesn't do a great job of answering these questions, let's look at those bowling chart metrics as run charts. So I'll take those six metrics and, and plot them here. And now we start getting a better sense of the ups and the downs, the range that that metric tends to stay within. Again, whether we like that performance or not is a different question. So we're looking to see if a metric is predictable, and hopefully we also see that it's capable of hitting our target. So if we're looking at these, we see a lot of fluctuation. This data point here might jump out at you and say, well, huh, that, that, that percentage of patients who recommend the hospital seemed pretty consistent and now it's dropped. And that's the benefit of using a process behavior chart instead of a run chart. We don't have to guess if it's a signal, we can use math. So if we're asking, when do we react? We want to react when there are signals. So here are the process behavior charts for those six metrics. And hopefully what jumps out at you is not just that we had a signal here, 
But this data point was actually just below the lower limit. That would have been a good time to react and ask what happened. Maybe the hospital could have headed off a problem that then apparently got much worse the next month. So we wanna make sure we don't overreact to noise. Now that doesn't mean we can't try to improve the average level of performance or try to shrink uh, the amount of variation through systematic process improvement like A3s. But the answer to the question of how do we improve a predictable system is not likely to be found in asking about a single data point. Why was that data point good? Why was that data point bad? Because the metric is just fluctuating as the result of a predictable process. And then we actually had a couple signals up here. And then in these charts, you know, they, they get a little bit wonky when uh, we have a really low average. Some organizations will uh, plot the number of days between relatively rare incidents instead of plotting the number of incidents per month. But the same idea applies. We're looking for signals instead of noise. So if we have our three key questions, are we achieving our target or goal? We can ask sub questions. You know, are we doing so occasionally? Or are we doing so consistently? We'd like to be reaching our goals consistently. Question two, are we improving? We want to uh, ask, can we predict future performance? A bowling chart can't do that. A single data point on a whiteboard can't do that. A process behavior chart can show us if we have a predictable metric, it's likely to be predictable into the future unless the system changes, which could include us doing something to change the system. Question three, how do we improve? When do we react? When do we look at a single data point or a run of data points and say, something's changed, we need to go figure out what that is. When do we step back and just try to improve the system in a less reactive way? I talk about this in the book of um, realizing and, and, and pointing to Toyota, of, you know, when you have a gap between actual performance and a target, there should be an A3 to help close that gap, to understand the system and, and the dynamics involved, that's different than just reacting to a single data point. I think we would do better defining gaps in terms of uh, average performance and our expected range of performance instead of just um, calling a single data point comparison a gap. And then there's a question of how will we know if we've improved? You know, I've talked to former Toyota people, we talk about using metrics, as a way of helping prove cause and effect between a change they've made to the system and the results. You know, we don't want to overreact and declare victory too soon based off of a single data point. We want to look for uh, significant and sustainable trends or shifts in our metric. So if we take this chart from the Toyota Way field book, what they call the trend chart, or we could call a run chart, when we turn that into a process behavior chart with calculated limits, this tells us uh, what, you know, a story from the voice of the process. The target and the upper limit coincidentally turned out to be almost exactly the same. This is a metric that's fluctuating around an average of 30. The target is 36, that's our gap. So the good news is that we have a predictable process that's going to produce between about 25 and 36 parts per hour. The bad news is that our target is 36. So we have a predictable process here that's not capable of meeting that goal. So we need to improve. If we were to take our pro uh, process behavior charts from the bowling chart and overlay the red and green, we can see here, you know, anything above zero um, is considered red. So anytime we have a serious event that's red. But we can look and see, is that predictable or is it a, a relatively rare occurrence? You know, the, 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 the immediate reaction to a signal versus the systematic reduction in the average. I think those are two slightly different thought processes. If we look at this recommend percentage chart, we can see there's up and down. This metric will occasionally fluctuate into the green but it's also going to be in the red. So one lesson here is that the same system might generate green some months and red other months. That doesn't mean anything's really changed. 
But here in this last chart, we see the meaningful signal. It's not just that it's in the red, but that it fell below the lower limit of our predictable range. So a lot of organizations would only react to red, which might mean overreacting, and, and when, when they should instead be using that time to do uh, more systematic improvement work that's less reactive. So a couple examples of charts here before we wrap up. Here's an example of a metric that's unpredictable and we're not meeting the target. So we have a, another case here where the upper limit is uh, really close to the target. One of our goals here could be to stabilize the system. And we can do so in a couple of ways. We can ask about the root cause of these data points that are worse than the lower limit. What went wrong? Do we identify that? Can we prevent it from occurring again? And then on the flip side, we have these three data points that are, it's not just because they're green, they're above the upper limit. So we should make sure we understand what happened. Can we learn from that? Can we standardize the process around that in a way that boosts our average performance? Here's a metric that's predictable and not meeting target. No amount of browbeating or um, you know, inspirational speeches will lead to uh, green performance. What we need to do is improve the system, boost performance and reduce variation so that it hopefully is in that green zone. And here's maybe an illustration of the best case, a metric that's predictable and is likely to always meet the target unless something changes in our system. So we can feel pretty confident that this metric will never fluctuate lower than this lower limit, which is better than the goal. Now it does beg the question of, should we continue improving the system if there's uh, you know, an important reason um, to raise the bar on the target or the goal? So um, you know, here's an example of a metric that is predictable, but it's just fluctuating between red and green because the average happens to be really close to the target. So we wanna make sure we don't overreact to every up and down and instead work to improve the system. And then here's an example of a chart, you know, that, that hospital rating score where it was fluctuating between red and green within a fairly narrow band, but not the band we'd want it to be. We had the drop way down into the red. So there might be some you know, reaction um, some process improvements, some corrective action taken that not only restores performance to where it had been, but hopefully boosts the average and boosts the limits to where we now have a system that's fluctuating around a higher average that generates limits that are all within the band of the green. You know, here, here's a system that's fluctuating within the green. And the reason it's important to look for signals is to make sure we find opportunities to learn and improve. So if organizations were only reacting to the red, they might ignore these two signals, one that's better than the typical performance level and one that's worse. So it's important to respond to those signals and ask what changed so we can prevent those bad days from occurring and hopefully learn from the, the good days so that we can improve the system and improve performance. So final thoughts, let me get through this before PowerPoint crashes again. What would Toyota do? Uh, when I went to uh, the Toyota plant for the first time and toured, um, it was a group of Lean and Six Sigma people, and one of the master black belts asked our tour guide, does Toyota use Six Sigma? And a lot of people might associate process behavior charts or SPC with Six Sigma. It actually dates, back, it predates total quality management, which predates Lean and Six Sigma. I think um, statistical process control should be part of our lean management system. And the answer from the Toyota guide was no, but we teach everybody the seven basic QI tools, which includes statistical process control. So I think there are a lot of uh, practical reasons for using these charts in the context of our lean management system, in reasons that might be more important than saying, well, Toyota uses this. I think uh, I've seen this prove to be quite useful in manufacturing, in healthcare. We use it at Kinexus, a software company I've been involved in. And we use these charts to help us realize, and we've proven this out, when we react less and we lead better, we can improve more. 
Um, so with that, I want to you know thank you for watching the webinar, PowerPoint crashes and all. Um, there are resources. You can download a free chapter of the book and learn more at measuresofsuccessbook.com. If you want to get the slides, um, you can go to markgraben.com slash lean frontiers. And there's um, other resources um, that I'm pointing to there. And if you've got questions beyond our session here, feel free. I'm really easy um, to find online. Um, so with that, Dwayne, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, really appreciate that. And here's a here's a data point for you. Typically, on a, the half hour webinars, we either get zero to maybe three questions. Uh, we had about ten questions come in for this, so there's a uh, there's a data point for you. Okay. Um, so we're not going to be able to get through all ten of these. Uh, we'll hand these off to Mark and. Uh, he can follow up with these uh, yep. offline, but let me uh, let me just address a few of these that came in. Uh, and thank you to those of you who and, submitted these early. And, and, and before and before you get in a couple of those, I'm not sure if the hypothesis should be lots of questions means I did a good job or I did a bad. <laughs> we'll see. You certainly spurred thinking. I, I would I would think that's safe to assume. Okay. So this this question comes from a person who is obviously in a non-lean organization where. Uh, an improvement mindset doesn't exist. And they're asking, what would you advise? Introduce people to mindsets first or to methods first? I mean, that's a good question. I don't know if it has to be an or. I mean, I think we can, can and should do those at the same time. And you know, I think we can talk about and we can demonstrate the mindsets that are included. So if, if, if it's in the context of process behavior charts, I think one of the lean mindsets that should be embedded in that from the beginning is don't blame individuals for performance levels that are driven by the system. And you know, I think I think we can demonstrate that from the get-go. Um, so the question is, how do you learn what those mindsets are? I guess you know, reading books about Toyota, going to Lean Frontiers conferences, um, having a good coach or mentor. Those are some of the ways you can learn those mindsets. Okay, so a question came in about uh, lagging and leading indicators and when a discussion should take place around uh, that part of data. Well, I'm, I'm not sure. Well, may, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question that, that's, that's being asked there, but I think the reality is we have both leading indicators and lagging indicators. You know, you, you might call them, you know, process metrics and end result metrics. Um, I mean, I think, you know, you can look at both of those using this process behavior chart methodology. Um, you know, I think leading indicators or process metrics um, give us an ability to detect a change in the system more quickly. You know, they're called lagging indicators uh, for a reason. So, um, you know, if we're looking at, let's say, I'll just think of one example related to the Kaizen and continuous improvement. A lagging indicator might be uh, employee turnover rates. And there might be a lot of different factors that contribute to turnover rates going up or down. And we could look at a process behavior chart to make sure we're not freaking out about a small increase in employee turnover. We learn that that probably tends to fluctuate. I think a leading indicator might be something like the number of ideas that are being implemented every month. You know, so I think, you know, we could also look at um, that. Um, actually, I wrote a blog post about um, a hospital I visited in, in Japan earlier this year that charted the number of employee ideas that have been submitted. And they were, um, they were really worried that the number had dropped. Now they weren't, they, they, they were using a run chart. When I took that data and put it into a process behavior chart, the conclusion I drew is that the number, it just fluctuates. And, um, you know, maybe it wasn't really worth, they were asking the question, why did it drop? When I think they could have been asking a slightly different question of what can we do to boost participation rates? So anyway, I don't, hopefully that helps answer yeah, that question. I, I think it did. Um, so we're, we're about five or six minutes over our target time. So we'll go, go ahead and wrap it up here. Um, thank you for those who participated in the session today. And Mark, uh, as always, thank you not only for, for being here with us today, but thanks for your continued contributions to the, the lean community. 
uh, through through your writing. Greatly appreciate your contributions. Well, thanks. Thanks uh, Mark for has graciously, Mark has graciously agreed to uh, give away three copies of his book. So we're going to do a random drawing of those that have registered for this webinar. So you'll be receiving an email here shortly, uh, those of you that won. So thank you all for participating. And just a quick reminder again with the, uh, the picture up here in the background, if you're looking for uh, uh, to get your accounting or HR teams uh, engaged with lean thinking, here's a great opportunity to do so. So this may not be directly for you. Uh, but if you've got accounting teams or HR teams that you would like to begin on that path or further along that path, uh, we'd love to see you at Jekyll Island, September 20th, 21st. You can find more information on leanfrontiers.com slash summits. So, Mark, again, thank you very much. And thanks to all who participated. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye-bye.